All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, returning in a prompt fashion. I get to serve two roles this session. I'll be your moderator again, but I also get to do a little bit of a lead off. So between now and 1230, we'll have a high level introduction to some of the challenges and plans that we have to overcome challenges. And I'll start this session with an overview of the air navigation and safety challenges. Now, frankly, I had a prepared script and I've thrown it out. Because you've heard a lot of what I might have said from the keynote speakers as we did an introduction. And the other reason I want to do this differently is because, frankly, we need to be a little bit more spontaneous in this business. Uh, we have a lot of plans. But our plans have to move from the point where they are ideas to actually being an implementation. We're really seeking an outcome that derives an improvement either through a new service, added capacity, improved efficiency, and of course always while sustaining the enviable safety record that aviation enjoys today. So, without further ado, I think I'll uh, try and get started here. We can put the slides up there, Mike. Okay. Long, long ago, in a galaxy far, far away, we had a group of folks come together, and I'm going too far, and they said, we'd like to create the future of air navigation. They were called the FANS Committee. FANS Committee came together in the late 80s, and they had a vision for a global integrated air navigation system. And they talked about that vision for a very long time. And we produced the first global air navigation plan in 2002, which described the concept and the outcome. It was a little light on how. It was much more focused on the what. And there have been iterations of the plan since that time. The most recent version published last year in 2016. But the plan before that in 2013 was the plan that began to focus on outcomes. The change, focused on the change that you're looking to achieve with all of this activity. So we had the aviation system block upgrade catalog that was published with a methodology on how to implement the technological improvements. We had roadmaps that described the dependencies that they had upon one another. And we had an idea that we would roll this out and have global implementation through regional and national action. But we were, again, light on that last part, the implementation. And so we've been developing an understanding of what's going to be required to move us from these plans to actual outcomes that you can witness in the airspace as an operator or as a customer. So that's what this conference is about. I spoke earlier about the idea that ICAO is much more engaged with the community because we have to be. We don't possess all of the knowledge, skills, and abilities necessary to move the industry because the industry today is much more corporate and privatized than it was 25 years ago. 25 years ago, the membership of ICAO, which is the states, possessed that knowledge because they had national airlines, had national air traffic control authorities, had national regulators, military operators. But today, the diaspora of aviation is essentially corporatized, privatized, and it's a community that exists outside of government. So ICAO works much more closely with the community through the industry associations and has encouraged collaboration with industry by governments who are members of ICAO. And so we're going to be talking a lot this week about what that looks like, what that needs to be. 
So the first part of the week, though, is your ideas. When I say your, I'm looking at the industry members, the industry participants. You've come here with an idea on how you want to move the marble and improve the state of affairs for whatever service or product you happen to be involved in. And for you to do that, a key element, which you'll hear from me multiple times over the next five days, is getting your approval from the regulator. Not for the regulator to ensure that you do it safely. That's your job. But for you to understand what it takes to get an approval so that you can do your job safely. And to see how all the components knit together in a way that can iterate more quickly than what we've done in the past. So, we have some challenges. I think it's, it's clear to say that the member states, the governments, um, need better alignment of their planning processes. Uh, there literally is a bump when you go across FIR boundaries in some cases. Changes in rules, changes in procedures, changes in flight uh, distance intervals, changes in technology, changes in phraseology. You've got to get a different kind of map out. There are a lot of changes that occur when you cross an FIR boundary in some parts of the world. In other parts of the world, there's been a lot of improvement that we have witnessed and that continues. So at ICAO, we're looking to have everyone continuing to improve. The most difficult, most challenging parts of the world may improve less quickly, but we don't want them left behind. We want them to continue to improve as we improve the state of the art at the other side of the spectrum. At ICAO, we're a pretty light organization. We don't do this on our own. We do this through you. We do this through the industry members who participate on the standards bodies that you just heard from and that also participate in our panels alongside members from the states who represent the government, either in air navigation service provision or in the regulation of flight safety, airworthiness, et cetera. And we're constantly looking to optimize the effectiveness of that regulatory process so that it represents less of a cost burden on the overall product. Because ultimately, you need to be able to operate with a profit. It's kind of a novel concept in some parts of aviation. I used to say that airlines were, the, were like the milk in the supermarket because the, the, the cost or the operating margin is so thin that for some of our recent history, the airline losses were great enough that they represented the profit from the previous 50 years in one or two years. That has changed because of, I think, prudent management, fiscal design that's been undertaken by the industry as it employs its own safety capability through safety management and through professional management of the airline industry. And we're seeing the same thing in other parts of aviation, business aviation, general aviation even, and certainly in military operations. So that needs to continue to be enhanced and the cost of regulating it needs to continue to be refined because the customer is only going to stand so much cost. The, um, the reason we're doing this is because it's a popular business. This business doubles in size roughly every 15 years. It doubled in size from 1968 to 1980, from 1980 to 1995, from 1995 to 2010. And it's on the way to doubling in this decade or slightly thereafter, and we expect it to double again from the current size by 2032 to 2035. Now, the system is very safe. We're enjoying some actually exceptional safety performance through the risk mitigation measures of the entire community. And for that, we have a lot to be grateful for. But we can't be complacent because of that. Because we're about to put pressure on the system through this growth, coupled with the environmental stringency that's coming from carbon offsets 
and the need to have a sustainable industry. And through the introduction of new interdependencies, we talked about information management and the introduction of information management will bring risks that have to be mitigated and managed as part of becoming more efficient. So that means the way we understand these new technologies has to be improved. So your task, one of the reasons you're here, is to help us bring the regulator along so that they understand the potential hazards as well as you do, so that they can work with you and collaborate with you to provide the solutions that the industry needs moving forward. So I want to talk briefly about evolving our approach here at ICAO. We've worked in the past through a process of states nominating experts to come here and work on panels. The panels would then draft proposed standards and recommended practices. Frequently those SARPs look a lot like the standards that they worked on previously at a standards making organization like you're okay, Air Inc, RTCA, SAE Aerospace. But they come here to provide a regulatory requirement to apply those technical specifications and standards in the global community. The struggle we've had is frequently we'll get those standards on the book and then find nobody wants them. Microwave landing system. I actually oversaw the installation of 15 microwave landing systems in Alaska. There were two airplanes capable of flying with those systems. But the reason we took them was because each one of them came with an approach lighting system. And that was worth a million dollars each. So we made a, a prudent decision that we could accept the microwave landing system because we wanted the approach lights. Because we didn't qualify for approach lights in the bush in Alaska because of the the lack of traffic. So that was a profitable standard there. I deviate only to say people use our standards in ways that we don't expect. So microwave landing systems, VHF data link version 3, VHF data link version 4, universal access transceiver. There are other standards that have been created and nobody did anything with. We prefer to have standards that are mature as they come into the building and that they have a proponent, similar to what happened with performance-based navigation. There were industry players who wanted performance-based navigation because there was a clear cost benefit associated with it. The standards can be created in the field, not at ICAO, and made ready for globalization if we provide the tools to the technical specialists in the field to understand what's necessary to iterate safely. And that's part of what I'd like you to think about this week as you talk about your proposals for new services, new capabilities, how can we make sure that the specialists in the field can participate in that process to help you iterate the product and then bring it to global readiness in a way that suits your needs. Now, I'm kind of breaking the paradigm because that doesn't sound like standardization. That could sound like anarchy. But I don't believe it is if we have principles in front of those individuals. And those principles are founded in our safety management processes. Safety management requires that you work through a safety assessment and create a safety case on each change. And the individuals in the field are very savvy at understanding what's necessary to reach those safety cases and trial those new capabilities and do it in a way that costs less, resolves problems more quickly, and provides us answers that can be globalized at ICAO through your processes to nominate them here, through the industry associations or from the states directly. Part of how we do that is evolving this safety performance and measuring to see that the outcomes that we expect actually occur. And that wasn't previously possible in our industry because we didn't have the data. But today, data is coming to us from a variety of sources that cross national borders and don't have the limitations that we previously had of governments 
hosting and managing them for their own airspace. There are providers today who can essentially provide the global surveillance picture to any entity that wants to evaluate the performance of air navigation services, looks to perform the performance of an airport or an airspace procedure. And I think that that performance methodology, that performance method, measurement and evaluation methodology is what will inform that local adaptation and regional and global adoption. When the ASBUs were originally started, there was a discussion about a lot of technology, but there was also a, a process discussion. And I want to walk through that process, perhaps in a little bit of a provocative way here with this slide. Every change requires an expected outcome. First, there has to be a problem. What problem are you solving with a change that you'd like to introduce? Are you adding capacity? Are you improving efficiency? Or are you improving safety by making something simpler? Or perhaps reducing a risk, putting a new control in? If you think that you have a known outcome, then you need to have a way of measuring to see, once you implement it, whether that outcome actually was achieved. So normally that's going to happen through an operational improvement. And you can usually see that in an air traffic control procedure, a pilot's operating handbook, perhaps in an airspace map where the airspace gets redesigned. And that outcome then needs to be understood by the people who will create it. So air traffic controllers, pilots, and the engineering professionals who sustain and develop the systems that they use have to understand their role in creating that outcome. If they do that, and they do that correctly, then you've got a product that you know is going to be accepted going into the system, and you can ask the regulatory community to evaluate your proposed product with that in mind. Now that's not a simple task because the regulatory community has multiple disciplines. Airworthiness inspectors need to be in a position where they will approve the change to the airframe. A flight operations inspector needs to be in a position to approve the flight operations manual change. And an air traffic regulator has to be in a position to approve the change that an air traffic controller or an air traffic system will impose on the operator. But going through the steps of asking for their evaluation helps to cost out what that change will actually require. Because it may not be as simple as it was originally envisioned in the first step. So working through this iterative collaborative design is actually crucial to implementation later because it helps to score the cost. And if the cost is greater than the benefit in line one, find a different solution. Then it can be evaluated and developed for a regulatory approval and trialed. And when the proposal comes to ICAO, it now has the standard, the, the technical specs perhaps, maybe a procedure for a PANS ATM or PANS Aerodrome, and guidance material on how the approval can be obtained, not just in one state or in one region, but globally. And that's a large part of driving down the cost of regulation, is to make that regulatory process repeatable for the innovator who wants to bring a solution to market. And that used to be, you know, this is a very, the very deliberate stayed process for commercial aviation, for general aviation in manned flight. But now, with the rapid development of unmanned aircraft, the proposals for high altitude vehicles, for introduction of commercial space and high speed vehicles, and the, now, and the attendant introduction of integrated networked systems, we have new risks that have to be evaluated much more quickly and decisions made so that you can produce and go to market with these capabilities. And that's what GANIS is about. GANIS is about telling us what you think you've got. And then the SANIS, the Implementation Symposium, 
Well, help us to iterate past that to how would the states think they could respond in the next global plan to help you bring that to market in a collaborative way and do it safely to achieve the outcomes that you have. So I've talked through this already, I think. We have some proof of concept that we've talked about in a variety of uh, venues. Uh, there are time-based separation criteria in use today at London Heathrow, not in the uh, ICAO standards at all. But they walked through that iterative process to develop, design, and implement those procedures at Heathrow to gain 10% effectiveness or 10% efficiency and capacity during certain wind conditions. Remote tower technology has been evolving outside of the ICAO umbrella, and we've frankly made very small adjustments in the PANS ATM so that air traffic controllers can utilize that technology. We have other developing capabilities that we need to address and recognize here, but not necessarily implement here in the near term. They get implemented in the field following the guidance for safety oversight and safety regulation. Our relationship with the standards body and the standards roundtable is a large part of how we think we can facilitate that activity by the industry working with local government. The standards organizations essentially work for their membership, but they work very closely with the governments that their membership is engaged with. And we believe that the standards process, the technical standards process, is a key enabler for the high-level performance-based standards that we produce here. And that's why that referencing that we're having available to us is so important for us. The other reason we like to collaborate in the roundtable is because as we understand what the industry is doing, that keeps us from having to go delve into it here separately. We would much rather wait and let that collaboration occur at the ground level and then provide us with an answer that can be considered for global adoption. So once it's adopted, how do we implement? Reduced vertical separation minimum is something I spent quite a bit of time on. It was a change in the air data computer so that the airplane could hold its height more accurately. Pretty simple change. It took 35 years to deploy globally. Performance-based navigation has been around for a while. And it's been deployed in a portion of the fleet and in a portion of the airports and airspace around the world. But each implementation has required really specific action and focus by a collaborative effort between regulators, ANSPs, operators, service providers, and manufacturers. So we've got to get better at doing this in a way that's repeatable. And at ICAO, we're working with the regional groupings in the planning and implementation regional groups and in the regional aviation safety groups to start to refine the prioritization of what's necessary in each region to meet the, the growth needs of the region and in some cases the underlying safety deficiencies that might exist because of a lack of infrastructure or a lack of technical capacity. So we're looking to tailor for the national and regional capabilities through the national plans, but that focus is moving ICAO away from developing standards and much more towards evaluating how those standards get implemented effectively in the field. So Wednesday, we'll have a, a discussion between the, uh, the chairs of the global PERGs and RASCs here in this building, down in conference room three. And we expect to see further alignment of their work programs with this objective and outcome. Now, this is a, an important checkpoint for us in the development of strategies that ICAO will take forward into the next triennium. So the current Global Air Navigation Plan, the Global Aviation Safety Plan, were developed essentially three years ago and are in force for use by the states in planning today for the next 15 years. 
The next iteration of those plans will be adopted at the 40th Assembly just under two years from now. And they will have some significant changes, we believe, because of the emergence of all of the new activity in the airspace and the introduction of new safety management programs and state safety programs. So we're looking for your ideas here. No idea is crazy because voicing it here from the industry, you're talking to 192 governments through ICAO. And for the states, you're talking to the best and the brightest of the people in the aerospace community who are bringing new products into the airspace. So it's a great opportunity for everybody to get together. And again, we thank you all for your participation. Now I'd like to uh, turn over the floor to um, our next presenter. Mr. Mervin Fernando is a member of the Air Navigation Commission. And he's going to talk with us about the Global Air Navigation Plan in a little bit more detail. Mervin? Margaret Jenny um, outlined three key points. She said, be clear, be concise, and be seated. I'm going to try to be clear, and I guarantee you I'll be seated, but being concise is not something I'm known for. So good morning, everybody, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the air navigation plan is the strategy to achieve a globally interoperable air navigation system offering safe, secure, and efficient air transport for people and goods worldwide, while limiting the impact on aviation on the environment. The GANP serves as a worldwide reference for the transformation of the air navigation system in an evolutionary and inclusive manner, so that no state or stakeholder will be left behind. During this presentation, we will see why the GAMP is needed now more than ever before, why it is necessary to update the GAMP, and what the main concepts under consideration are in an ongoing collaborative worldwide effort between all stakeholders, that's industry, international organizations, R&D bodies, manufacturers, and so on, to ensure a fully harmonized global air navigation system. But before delving into the details, please allow me to introduce myself. My name is Mervyn Fernando. I am one of 19 members of the Air Navigation Commission. And for those of you not familiar uh, with the commission, the ANC is one of two executive bodies of ICAO. The Council is its governing body, and the Commission is the technical advisory body to the Council. As a technical body, the Commission considers and recommends standards and recommended practices and procedures for air navigation services for adoption or approval by the ICAO Council, and that later will be implemented by stakeholders to guarantee interoperability of systems and harmonization of procedures at a global level. This is so as to meet the expectations of our society in general and the aviation community in particular in terms of safety, efficiency, environment, cost effectiveness, and other interrelated areas. But before we go on, forget about me as Commissioner Fernando. Today I'm going to be your captain. I like that. <laughs> so please fasten your seat belts and welcome aboard this flight to tomorrow's air navigation system through the global air navigation plan. Our flight plan today starts with our goal, followed by the winds broadcast by the trends and emerging opportunities, taking us to our first stop, the requirements of the air navigation system ahead of us. This first stop will fuel the need for an evolutionary transformation of the system realized through global interoperability, scalable implementation, where collaboration with industry is key to achieving our end goal. So, here's an important question. What is our ultimate destination? 
What do we want from tomorrow's air navigation system? So listen. Listen very carefully. Can you hear it? No? Well, that's the sound of tomorrow's system. It will be a more quiet system where thanks to the advances of technology that power aircraft, nobody will be disturbed. At least you'll not lose sleep. It will be a cleaner, greener system thanks to the commitment that the aviation community has given to protecting the environment. Safety is paramount. And although today flying is extremely safe, with the evolution of the air navigation system, we will make it even safer. This evolution will bring along new threats to the system, but we will take a proactive approach to protect the air navigation system and keep it resilient to disruptions. All of this will be undertaken in a cost-effective way for all stakeholders through innovation and the right investments at the right time. This is the future of flying. Safer, cleaner, cheaper, key to power the social well-being of all peoples of the world. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, this is the flight deck again. With just a little more information for you. Our short flight today will take us about 20 years into the future. The winds are blowing in our favor. New forms of demand, emerging technologies, and new ways of doing businesses are restoring to aviation a sense of wonder and excitement that anything is possible. Moreover, they're bringing new opportunities that call for a transformation of the air navigation system. As Steve mentioned a few minutes ago, Air transport is expected to double every 15 years, moving passengers and goods around the world quicker than ever before. This growth will be boosted by a new generation of aircraft, ranging from small unmanned aircraft systems to upper atmosphere super and hypersonic aircraft that are now being developed and which will demand air navigation system resources, new resources. In support of these new airspace users and aircraft types, employment will grow rapidly and the global GDP could double by 2040. So, enabling technologies such as increasing autonomous systems and artificial intelligence will encompass a wide array of systems capabilities in aviation that range from the abilities of current automatic systems such as autonomous and remotely piloted aircraft to highly sophisticated systems that would be needed to enable aircraft and their air traffic management systems to perform complex tasks. Aviation embraces the concept of full connectivity. Anything that can be connected will be connected. This provides many alternatives to the way we currently design our basic infrastructure. This expansion of airspace management, coupled with the opportunities provided by readily available technology, means that there will be necessary connectivity at all places, at all times. This places a premium on the information in this universally shared infrastructure and on aviation's approach to cybersecurity. Air navigation service providers no longer need to invest in dedicated automation infrastructure as computing and storage become worldwide commodities. The paradigm to integration through information enables a shift from large monolithic programs for ANSPs, decision support, to a world of aviation applications. So the shift from an environment in which every piece of information needs to be human readable to an environment where machine readability is an axiom and applications 
turn the mountain of available data into actionable information and intelligence for decision making is the new normal. Humans no longer need to play the role of computational engine and decision maker. However, even in the increasingly automated environment, humans will always be part of the design and management of the system. The operational environment is complex and dynamic, and system designers cannot anticipate all possible circumstances. Humans are necessary to create innovations that meet unique situational demands, which the air navigation system, as designed and anticipated, cannot address. The air navigation system, although recognized as a system of systems, is also a business of businesses, highly dependent on each other vertically, airspace users, aerodrome operators, air navigation service providers, and at the same time, in competition for market share horizontally. This approach is required, considering it supports investments in several businesses in a coordinated manner, leading to synchronization of ground and onboard capabilities. The important role of the regulator will remain. However, there is a need to move towards regulations that set performance standards society expects rather than specifying in great detail individual technical components. This regulatory framework should facilitate and encourage innovation to meet the performance requirements and support, of, and support the evolution of the system. States will be expected to provide assurance that their regulatory processes will support a business-to-business -business approach, allowing more options for services, provisions, and enhancing quality of services in their areas of responsibility. This is in recognition that aviation is a global business and should deliver consistent quality services at a global level. So ladies and gentlemen, your captain again. If you looked out on the right side of the aircraft, you will see that these developments and drivers of change are proceeding at an accelerating rate driven by the expectation that they will return significant benefits in terms of safety, security, and environment and economical sustainability. So this is our first stop, and it is a high-performing air navigation system. The vision for the future cannot be realized without global interoperability and equitable access to air navigation resources. Without jeopardizing the safety of air operations, if air traffic growth and new airspace users are to be accommodated within the finite resource that is airspace, the necessary capacity must be built into the air navigation system. A key driver to dealing with the global environment, uh, the global environment challenge is the efficiency of air operations, which today is based on procedures and technology developed in the last century. New technologies and concepts of operations will enable aircraft to fly using procedures that reduce fuel burn and cut down on emissions. Passengers book flights based mainly on ticket price and the scheduled time of arrival. Arrival times are therefore critical in terms of cost effectiveness, operational efficiency, and business credibility. New threats that impact safety and resilience are increasing, and states and industry, together with other stakeholders, should work together to protect the air navigation system. It's okay, just just a few more bing-bongs and we're done with that. Now, if, if you look out on the other side of the aircraft, that's this side, you will see that in order to achieve this and to realize the vision, 
a series of transformational changes have been identified. The global air navigation system will increase in complexity to support the new demand. As a way of managing this complexity, the evolution of the system is built upon the notion of management by trajectory, empowered by access to timely and accurate shared information with the goal of providing improvements in mission and business execution. Exchange among airspace users, air traffic management systems, and aerodrome operations ensures that timely and consistent decisions are made on a network and flight-centric basis. New users such as spaceport operators, commercial space operators, and new users of high-altitude airspace will all be part of that dynamic decision-making process in this business of businesses. This evolution will be enabled by a progressively increasing reliance on automation, technologies, and the use of standardized interoperable ground and air systems in an integrated infrastructure. This aviation infrastructure, based on the ubiquitous sharing of information, will interface with non-aviation transport actors to achieve an efficient, integrated, multimodal transport system. So the aviation community is encouraged to modernize the provision of air navigation services by applying innovative solutions to avoid unnecessary costs in order to facilitate a scalable implementation where member states, together with all stakeholders, advance their air navigation capabilities based on their specific operational requirements. ICAO has developed the Aviation System Block Upgrade Framework. It's a flexible and scalable family of solutions that fit the diverse needs of global users. It is recognized that one size does not fit all, and the functionalities can be implemented as needed based on specific and agreed upon operational requirements. The advantage following this pre-coordinated structure is that interoperability is ensured and overall operations can be harmonized. There is no end state or date, as there is continuous improvement that ensures aviation adapts to global, regional, and local opportunities and challenges in a timely manner. So, ladies and gentlemen, in a few minutes, we will reach our final destination. Now, at ICAO, we continue to find new ways to evolve our approach in order to support the states and the international aviation community. Given the trends and emerging opportunities that I showed you in the previous slides, we know that the status quo will not serve as a successful recipe to achieve a high-performing system in terms of capacity, efficiency, and predictability to sustain our enviable safety, security, environment, and cost-effectiveness records and to continue to power social well-being. We do not believe in a Big Bang program delivery. Instead, we expect an accelerating evolution to deliver our solutions to achieve the necessary performance at the global, regional, and local levels. As part of the support to achieving the necessary performance, ICAO has two other global plans to assist states in the two other important performance areas, safety and security. These plans, the Global Aviation Safety Plan, and the recently endorsed Global Aviation Security Plan are aligned and will be accompanying the Global Air Navigation Plan. So coming back to the GANP, the GANP also needs to evolve to ensure its alignment with the new technologies and trends brought about by the industry and other stakeholders. And that is why, in order to better communicate with technical and high-level 
managers, and to not leave any state or stakeholder behind, we are proposing a multi-layered structure for the 2019 edition of the GAN. This multi-layered structure consists of four layers. Two global layers, a regional layer, and a local one. The highest level, the global managerial level, will be the front door for all stakeholders to the aviation world. It will be a document written in executive language, endorsed at the highest level. It will contain global performance ambitions and a conceptual roadmap. The technical level will be web-based, uh, will be a web-based application which, from which reports, paper and soft copy may be generated. Um, we will see a version of this web-based application later this week when SANIS deals with the modernization of the air navigation system. It will contain the definition of basic building blocks for the backbone of the air navigation system, a review of the ASBU framework focused on implementation, a performance-based method for defining strategic implementation of air navigation improvements, and an update of the key performance indicator catalog, which will help in the measurement of performance benefits. The regional level will contain ICAO regional air navigation plans and other regional initiatives. And with the fourth level, global, regional, and national plans will be aligned. More information about the current and future edition of the Gantt can be found on the IKO public website. Now, if you were to visit this uh, site under Global Priorities and click on the Air Navigation Capacity and Efficiency and select the Global Air Navigation Plan, on the left of the page, you will find the Gantt News and Resources. This is where you will find all the information you may want about the development of the Global Air Navigation Plan or you could do like the rest of us, just Google it. And you can find the website in the second link. So, welcome to ICAO. Our flight has landed on schedule and the time check is now five minutes past 12 noon in Montreal. Uh, we have arrived on time. The temperature outside is a minus 12 degrees Celsius, but no worries. We're nice and warm and cozy in this room, so I hope you'll enjoy a very fruitful symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Mervyn. So the Air Navigation Plan has its companion, the Air Aviation Safety Plan, and our next speaker will present that to you. Mr. Catalan Radu is the Deputy Director for Safety at ICAO. And uh, he has prior experience as the Director General of Civil Aviation in Romania, was the President of the European Civil Aviation Commission for several years, and has been working here at developing new ways to provide regulatory capabilities that we can propose to the states. But this is our opportunity to tell you a little bit about the current strategy here, and then that will set you up to be able to give us your needs through the week. Catalan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Steve, and uh, Captain uh, Marvin for bringing us uh, to the ground in a safe uh, way. Uh, here in Montreal, and good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure uh, for me to, to be with you here and to see you all in the cold, uh, sunny uh, weather of uh, our beautiful headquarters place. Um, in terms of, uh, you saw that the global plan explained, uh, but how the safety is supporting the development of growth and how we can all interact in order to achieve whatever we want. Because at the end, what we want is to have aviation and to 
came from A to B in a safe and secure and sustainable manner. But in order to do so, we don't really care as a passengers uh, what's behind. But we need to know that uh, here in this room we are defining the future developments of air navigation and based on that we need to know some involvement of safety in this picture. And that's why today's presentation on the Global Aviation Safety Plan it's more focused on how we are linked uh, uh, at the safety level with all the developments uh, and improvement in air navigation and also how the industry is uh, coordinating with us the, the future developments in this uh, area. So uh, we have uh, our growth that will expand and um, normally the forecast say that in the next 15 years or each 15 years we have a double of traffic. And based on that, uh, we need to be sure that uh, the capability to manage traffic is supported by the maintaining of, of the same high level of safety or even uh, an improvement in this safety level. And sometimes if we are not managing in a proper manner, we can introduce some risk in the system. And that's why an ICAO we start developing uh, a strategic uh, approach that links both air navigation and safety in order to be able to, to ensure that uh, we can move forward and modernize and uh, improve our infrastructure in the same time maintaining or even improving uh, safety. And this should be uh, a common uh, goal of all of us. So we have the two strategic uh, key documents in ICAO because, uh, as you might know, uh, those documents now represent our way forward. And uh, in terms of GAMP and GAS, the global plans, we are trying to define the technological level where we are going and trying to, to also put in place new mechanisms to assess the risk and to maintain the capability of aviation uh, to adapt to the new transformational challenges. What is the GASP? The GASP is representing a, a global uh, framework for, for safety improvement. And also, speaking at the global level, we need to go deeper on a more granular level at the regional and state level. Because by all means, what's important today is to be able to set global targets while keeping into account different uh, approaches taken by the region and uh, different level of implementation of standards and uh, different uh, way of doing business uh, around the world. So that's why we need to, to, to be sure that we have this global strategy, we have the framework for regional and national plans, but also we have a harmonization and coordination of our efforts. What's important in the GASP is that we can see all this coming together and who's doing what. And all this because what we want at the end is to have our uh, aspirational safety goal achieved, which is zero fatalities. At the end, it's what and why we are doing what we are doing, what we are thinking of safety, because what we want is to be sure that we have no fatalities in, in our aviation world. Uh, as uh, my colleagues already expressed, we have uh, several um, global plans, and uh, at the last IKEA assembly, uh, the member states and industry ask us to, to provide, uh, as ICAO, a global plan for each strategic objective. And in the same time to keep it harmonized and uh, structured in a way that will be easily accessible to the member states and all our stakeholders. And that's why we have a multi-layer approach uh, for each and every global plans of ICAO. Uh, we have today the, the GAMP, the GASP, and the GASEP, the Global uh, uh, Air uh, Security Plan. And we have Aviation Security Plan, and we have also uh, some uh, uh, preparation for the, the, the other two strategic objectives, economic development and environment. So we have this layer approach where we have uh, the challenge that we have in front of us, doubling the traffic, while thinking of the greater uh, um, motivation that we have, the sustainable development goal and the link the, with the UN system, but in the same time at the level of IKEA, the No Country Left Behind initiative that put more focus on implementation. We have our aspirational goal, which is, as I said, zero fatalities. And we have the, the, uh, the second layer, which is the global targets, uh, uh, global goals, global targets, and also indicators to measure all these uh, goals and targets. Because we want to be able to measure the, the performance of the system. Uh, 
In the same time, all these are linked internally in, the, in IKEO with our business plan and operational plan to be sure that whatever we are doing here, it's contributing to the achievement of the goal. Also, we have the roadmaps that address uh, the, the national level, the state level, uh, but also the regional uh, level, because we need to look not only to the states, but also to the region. And, of course, industry is extremely important for us, so we have a roadmap for the industry as well. All this is um, uh, also supplemented by an implementation program that is internal to IKEO that will tell us what to do and who's doing what in the, in the building. For the safety, we have, uh, as I said, the Global Aviation Safety Plan. We have our aspirational goal. We have uh, six uh, global uh, targets, and uh, you'll see them uh, later on in the week when uh, my colleagues will, will make a presentation more specific on the, on the development and the results that we have uh, for the next edition of the GAMP. We have 11 targets and indicators associated with. We also have uh, our roadmaps for implementation. And in terms of uh, roadmaps, we have different layers for states, region, and uh, industry. Like that, everyone knows what the role and how we can better manage uh, to, to achieve the same uh, capability. In the same manner, we have the, the GAMP uh, that, uh, as, as, as my colleague uh, Mervin said, uh, it's supporting the sustained rapid growth in a transformational uh, uh, challenge way. And also, we have some key performance areas, uh, priorities, and performance ambitions that are linked to, to the achievement of the goals. We have roadmaps, and you saw the, the kind of layered approach that we, we took in all our uh, global plans. We also have a program for implementation, tools developed by our colleagues that are trying to help the states in the region and assessing their real needs and based on the needs to try to see what module of ASBUS and what operational improvement will be able to, to implement in a, in a sustainable manner without uh, uh, addressing uh, uh, necessarily uh, the, the growth, but uh, trying to, to be sure that whatever is put in place will cope with the future. Because today they might have everything they need. But tomorrow, you need to look uh, at the forecasted growth and to be able to say, OK, I might need to put this kind of this piece of infrastructure in front of me, and I need to, to assess it properly. We have some aspects that uh, are uh, embedded in, in the GAMP. And of course, the, the increasing capacity and efficiency, it's, it's, it's coming together with the improvement of safety. But also, we have all elements of the GAMP uh, that uh, are having elements of safety embedded inside. And if you are looking, we also need to have for each and every operational improvement, of course, depending on the environment there, uh, there, uh, where they are applied, we need to have a safety analysis and the safety case uh, associated with the technical specification and the business case. And that's why in the new draft GASP, uh, the next edition 2020-2022, we have some elements that links the global plans. So for our uh, GASP, we have a specific goal dedicated to infrastructure, which is goal number six, ensure appropriate infrastructure. It's available to support safe operation. And for this, we have, uh, we have encouraged uh, states and uh, industry to, to push uh, uh, the, the implementation of the core elements of infrastructure. Uh, my colleagues are calling uh, in the GAMP BBBs, the basic uh, building blocks, and those are elements of, of uh, um, improvement and uh, implementation that should be firstly addressed by the states. Also, this is measured by an indicator uh, looking at the number uh, of uh, elements implemented by each and every state. In terms of involvement of the industry, we are as uh, a forum today here because we are focused on listening to you as an industry, what you want from us to put in place and how to manage the, the future expansion of aviation. So uh, we, uh, when we define the new uh, edition of the, the GASP, we have a study group where the industry is heavily represented. We have the major uh, international organization and professional association, but also the, we have um, elements uh, and uh, uh, inputs coming from airports, ANSPs, and uh, airlines. So 
the industry is participating in our in our efforts and also we are trying to 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 set up goals specific goals for the industry because what we consider as being important is to to drive also forward the the industry and to try to cope with the challenge that we have, but not only working with the states, we want and we need, we really need your support. And that's why we have the goal number five in our GASP, which is the increased use of industry programs. Uh, for that, we, we also encourage the service providers from all areas to try to use your, uh, harmonize uh, safety performance indicator in their SMS. Doesn't mean that we are imposing a set a type of, of, of uh, uh, safety performance indicators, but whatever you are using in measuring your performance in your SMS, it's harmonized and uh, uh, for the same name of the indicators, you have the same metric all over the world. So we are trying to adjust now and we are working with a set of uh, states and um, also with a member of the industry uh, right now to try to, to come up with a set of, of, of uh, library of uh, globally harmonized indicators. And also to, to try to uh, encourage the member uh, of, of the industry to participate in, uh, in the assessment program driven by the industry, by your uh, association. And it's important to do so because like that, if we have access to this kind of uh, assessment um, programs uh, that are recognized by ICAO, we start uh, looking at how states can use those programs and we try to avoid overlapping and um, uh, spending of uh, efforts in different ways. We have also uh, the part of the roadmap that it's uh, designed for the industry. And your colleagues in our study group uh, have uh, looked and said, okay, we have our specific tasks to, uh, to accomplish in order to help the achievement of, of the goals that are uh, highlighted in the GASP. And there is a whole series of, of elements that you can put in place as an industry to try to drive forward the, the enhancement of the, the goals. I think that uh, this is mostly what I wanted to, to, to say today, to try to show you that we are working together, we are trying to put uh, our best uh, in order to better support the growth for tomorrow and uh, uh, the way we are doing it's uh, collaborating and trying to, to always be harmonized in terms of global plans and our action. And uh, a little bit more on the uh, development of the GASP and uh, what are the targets, the goals, and how a roadmap uh, looks like will be on the next Thursday uh, when we have a discussion, a specific uh, panel dedicated to the GASP. So once again, thank you very much, and uh, I'm looking forward to your question and uh, any kind of role. Okay, thank you, Catalan. So, you've heard a little bit about the GAMP, an aspiration for the future with some fundamentals on how we're going to roll out the uh, near-term capabilities. And you're seeing the tie-in to the safety planning, which is, I think, crucial. And from the Air Navigation Bureau's perspective, those are two key elements to some change that we would like to see you considering as you present through the course of this week. How can we assist you in moving your ideas to standardization more rapidly? And do it in a way that allows it to be implemented in the places where it needs to be implemented in less time than it took before. So, how do we improve on the state of collaboration we've achieved so far? We've got everybody in the room. Do we have everybody in the right place to where they can play full out? And I think that's part of the evolution that we're looking to seek here this week. And I will encourage you to really engage with each other in that dialogue, please. So first, before I go on, I'd like to thank all of the speakers this morning for their efforts in preparing to provide you with their insights and to introduce the concepts that the uh, symposium will be working through for the rest of the week. So please join me in a round of applause for the speakers.
Now, the afternoon will break us into our operational streams, the subject streams. And that means that in some cases, some of you need to buddy up because it's hard to be in all four rooms at one time. And we appreciate that that is a difficulty or a challenge when you're one or two people from a delegation. So we really do urge you to seek someone out in your region or an adjacent state or in your industry or your state, partner up and split up so that you can cover all of the things that are of interest to you. In this assembly hall, we're going to be putting a divider through the hall over the course of lunchtime. And this will be conference room one on the left, conference room two on the right. And so we'll have one of our streams on each side. Down on the ground floor, on the first floor, we have conference room three, and that will be the third stream. And then on the third floor of the building, we have conference room five, and that'll be the fourth stream. So we've, we've kind of taken an, an eye with the registrations on the size of the different streams and placed them in the rooms where we think we have the capacity required. So check the boards outside to understand which stream is in which room. Tentatively, I believe uh, innovation and emerging operations are in conference room one on this side. Future of CNS and avionics is to my left, your right. Conference room three will have information management and conference room five on the third floor will have the future of civil military cooperation. Now, lunch will be provided outside of the uh, conference room here and uh, we will expect that to, we'll start promptly at 2 o'clock with the streams, so please be on time so that we don't have delays on any one stream and we can keep all of the programs operating pretty much in synchronous um, activity. And I also want to ask that you take materials out of the room at the end of this session because conference services will be in here to do the realignment of the room over the lunchtime period. So thank you all very much for your attention. Enjoy the lunch and the networking. We'll see you at 2.